Well done. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. It might rain, they said. It's a media. They get on TV and try to scare everybody to death. And those folks that are so easily scared, well, they're just going to miss a good time at church. Amen. We're already having a good time. Praise the Lord. It is good to see you today. Hallelujah. Uh, let me check everybody out. We've got to make sure I make some notes here. Make sure nobody's out of place. You know, I don't want anybody stealing your seat. <laughs> we are in the last of this sermon series called Ministry Matters. And part seven, what the world needs. We've looked at this each week over the last six weeks, concluding it with the seventh week to really kind of cap it all off. In chapter... One and two of First Peter, the apostle is talking about all the things we've been dealing with over the six weeks. Who you are in Christ. And we did the sermon on who do you think you are. And uh, understanding your identity in Christ. Let me say this. If you don't know who you are, you're going to be a wreck as a Christian. You've got to know who you are. I counsel a lot of people in, in crisis. And even this last week on a phone call, I was telling this individual... You know, I don't know why I keep failing. I say, because you don't have any understanding of who you are. Oh, yes, I do. I say, well, if you do, then you haven't put it into practice, or you're really being deceived. Because you can approach the enemy with victory when you begin to really understand who you are. And I believe 90% of the warfare in dealing with that is an understanding of who I am in Christ, what's God done for me, how has he changed my life, and how has that change affected me in such a way that it affects the world around me. When I really know that I'm a child of God, it, what did First John and, and First John says when the apostle writes the church says we are of God little children and the wicked one cannot touch us catch that again we're of God and man next time the devil comes knocking on your door just answer say, hey I'm of God I'm a child of God I belong to God I'm a, I'm a daughter or a son whatever it might be of God I belong to him and I am not backing down I am not shutting up I am not giving up I'm not going to back away I'm going to live for you today just realize who you are in Christ but then we talked about in regard to that. That, that we've been changed, but we've been changed for a reason. One, so that we can have worship ministry upward to the Father. Second, so we can have our inward ministry to one another. You are an important part. You say, well, I just kind of come on Sunday. If that's your mindset, then you really don't know who you are. All right, you're missing out on that, Mark, too. You realize who you are, the importance you have, and the, and the valuable part you play in the body of Christ. You start relating to each other differently. But then we talked about last week, who do you think they are dealing with the lost world? We need to understand who, who they are, who we are, and what our responsibility is. In case you don't know it, all right, this is important, catch this. In case you're not aware of it, we will all stand before God on these issues. Did I realize what God had done for me? Did I responsibly recognize those changes and differences in my life, and, which resulted in a ministry that I have to the Father, that upper adoration ministry? It resulted in a ministry that I have in the fellowship of Christ and the body of Christ that I am needed here if I'm not here, it hurts. If I'm not doing my part, it hurts. If, I, I'm, if I'm not bearing people's fellowship burdens within the fellowship, it hurts. Them, it hurts me. If I don't know that, I'm certainly not going to be aware of what I need to be doing in the world, that outward ministry. But I want to kind of, kind of wrap this all up with this mindset of what the world needs. And it really what the world needs is you being what God's called you to be. The Bible says that we have been changed in 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2 to get down to all those changes so that we might proclaim the excellencies of the one who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're here to make a proclamation. You're here not only to make a proclamation, you're here to be a proclamation. Your life stands as something that's been radically changed and out of that radically changed belief that you have in Christ comes a radically changed verbiage out of your mouth. All right? You have to do away with this mindset and this terrible bad theology that says this, well, my life just wins people to Jesus. Well, let me ask you, how many have we baptized as a result of your life? Zero. How many people are in heaven today just because you live a nice life? Zero. It is your life mixed with your words. There's no, if you study 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2 carefully, you'll see that, hey, when your life's been changed, it affects your behavior, and it also affects what comes out of your mouth. What's coming out of my mouth? The excellencies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that word? Aretes in the Greek means to make, to, 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 to proclaim the message of his greatness. Remember the message is God can and God is able and God will. We know that God is able. We know God can. That's what that word means. That God is the hero, all right? Not you, not me. God's the hero. So what are we talking about? We're talking about our father. We're talking about our hero. We're talking about our deliverer and our savior and our redeemer, Jesus. That's our message. But it has to be married to, that talk does, married to our walk. No walk with that talk, no talk with that walk, it's ineffective. 
All right? If all you just say, I'll just need a life Christian life and, you know, maybe somebody will ask me. No, it doesn't work that way. They don't have to ask when you already tell them. So we have this responsibility. So it, it all is summed up in this particular word. And at the men's retreat, Dr. Autry did a, about 15 minutes on this. So, you know, I, I can't do anything in 15 minutes. It takes me that long to find my socks. <laughs> Especially if they're still in the dryer. It ate one of them somewhere. <laughs> but let's, let's look at this, this verse I want to look at today in Matthew chapter 5. I'm not functioning. You want to reset that PowerPoint clicker on for me? You know how to do that just on the PowerPoint alone, the little deal in the corner. Just close it and open it. But if we get into this, in Matthew 5, verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under foot of men. Why don't you look at that in the, the Amplified Bible? So. In the Amplified Bible, it goes on to talk. Can you bring that one up? It's the next click. Because I don't have it here. I just wrote it on the screen. You're the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, its strength, its quality, how can its saltiness be restored? It is not good for anything any longer but to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. The idea here is the Lord is making a statement about who you are and what you do here. Again, it's the same thing that Peter's talking about. You're different, therefore what you do is different. All right? You're the salt of the earth. You make a difference in the world around you. You're supposed, to be, you're supposed to be something unique. In fact, salt is one of the most common substances on the planet today. It can't be destroyed by time. It can't be destroyed by fire. It is a unique substance. It's also known as white gold. It's one of the most significant substances in history, along with iron, gold, and wheat. You have salt. In ancient societies, salt was the, one of the most valuable social and economic commodities. You read in the Catholic Bible in the Maccabees, it talks about how the, at one time taxes were, were imposed upon salt. The ancient Egyptians understood the value of salt. In fact, it was a symbol of luxury in Egypt. In fact, it was used for mummification as well as preservation of olive oil, olives and fish and things like that and, and meats. At one time, salt was such a valuable commodity in the Roman Empire that salt that would be brought from the sea and brought inland was, was considered such value you could trade it for slaves. But salt, not only is it a unique commodity, also when you start looking at scripture, it has some incredible, uh, significant, and, and figurative, figurative symbology. In relationships of friendship and, rela and, and, and covenants and, and treaties and alliances that people would make, we've talked about the blood covenant before. There's also a salt covenant. In ancient times and in oriental land, salt was a symbol of hospitality and friendship and deep relationship. That if you were truly friends with somebody, you truly were interested in the person, you'd sit down and you would share bread and salt as a symbol of your friendship with the other person. That you were there to be their friend, you weren't there to do them any harm. If you violated the eating of salt in these kind of relationships and didn't sit down with your friendship and relationship and have salt and share the salt and the bread together, it was considered that of being a traitor. Salt was considered a divine gift in ancient times. If you've ever read Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, there's a little interesting story in that story about salt. The captain of the 40 Thieves, the captain of the robber band, he, he comes to visit Alibaba, masking ultimately his, his intention to murder, murder Alibaba, but as he sits down and meets him and, you know, he's disguised and meets Alibaba and sits down at a meal, salt and bread are offered there. But he refuses, he's unwilling to partake of the salt and the bread. Kind of overlooked by Alibaba, but not his, this, the little faithful slave girl named Morgiana. She watched as this man refused the salt and the bread and she she he writes in the book and the story says as she makes this quote who is he that eats only meat wherein there is no salt salt was the symbol of the relationship later on when she recognized that this robber captain was under disguise she said to herself so this is the cause why the villain eats not of salt for now he seeks an opportunity to slay my master whose mortal enemy he is in other words, the giveaway for her was that when he sat down with Alibaba, he wouldn't partake of salt. So she, what, what's the deal with that? Why aren't you eating salt? Because he has another intention. In fact, in culture, salt and blood were interchangeable. We have the blood covenant we've talked about in scripture. 
and how that the blood and the giving of a life and the symbol of the blood that's been shed for us is what makes Solomon holy, the covenant that we have with our heavenly father. In fact, Hebrews calls it the blood of the everlasting covenant. The blood symbolized and, and, and sealed and stamped that eternal relationship that we had with our father. God not only made promises, he sealed it with the blood of his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But blood and salt were both used in ratifying covenants and relationships. And I did that series on the, on, on the blood covenant. We talked about how it became a, a symbol of our harmony, our fidelity, or our union, or our, our constancy with one another. In those ancient cultures also where, where cultures were saltless, there, there wasn't a lot of salt in the culture, culture. meat, after it had been prepared, would be taken and served along with a little bowl of fresh blood from the animal which it was taken from. And it would be dipped in there lightly to add the saltiness to the flavor. Babies were washed in, 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 in those cultures, not with salt, but washed with blood. There's a covenant that's mentioned in Scripture. We call it the salt covenant. And it's mentioned three times in Scripture. The first mention of it is the covenant of salt with Aaron and who was, you know, Moses' brother and the priesthood in Numbers 18. Aaron is speaking, the Lord is speaking. This is all the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer to the Lord. Have I given unto thee and to thy sons and thy daughters with thee by statute forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord and unto thy seed. So the Lord is making an agreement with the priesthood of Aaron there about what they would be responsible for in worship and in ministry. He said, I'm going to seal this with this covenant of salt. In fact, God goes on to tell the people about a covenant of salt in Leviticus when he says, every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season those offerings with salt so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offerings. And with all your offerings, he went on to say, there shall be an offering of salt. Why? Because it signified the permanency. It signified the, the perpetuity of, of this covenant relationship. There was an everlasting covenant that the, that the people had with, with God himself. For that reason, as you look at that, salt always represents the permanence that associates and it, it's associated with a covenant relationship. God even made a salt covenant with David and his family in, in uh, 2 Chronicles 13, 5. Do you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave you the rule over Israel forever. And he gave it to David and his sons by the covenant of salt. So you see this mention and the importance of salt in scripture, how that represents a covenant relationship. And just as blood was used to seal a covenant, God also made covenants that were sealed with salt. In fact, he says, he prizes salt so highly, every offering had to be salted. The Hebrew word for salt stems from a, a, a term we would say in the English name, milch, M-L-C-H, and it's shared by all semantic languages, this particular terminology. In the New Testament, we have the Greek language it gives us, and the term for salt in the Greek language is halas. It occurs seven times as a noun. It also occurs twice as a verb and once as an adjective when it's using the word salt. The English word salt does not come from that word in the Greek or the Hebrew. It comes from a Latin term, which is the word S-A-L, which was the meaning for sea. In fact, this is the word which we get the word salary from. When you draw a salary, well, you've heard the terminology, he's worth his salt. So even the word salary comes from the idea of salt. The salt had value, salt had meaning. So if you're, if you're worth your wages, that idea was he's worth his salt. He's worth his salt. So you see there in the scripture, we have a lot to say about salt. You say, well, what, what, why is such emphasis upon salt? And what, what's so special about salt? Well, he says to us here in this passage in Matthew, that you are the salt of the earth. That you. Now he's talking not just to the disciples, but who else do you think he's speaking to? He's speaking to every born again believer, every child of God. He's speaking to Joe Arms. He's speaking to me. He's speaking to you. And what you have to do is, is with all scripture, there has to be an owning of it and a personalization of it an identification with it. That God is literally saying that Joe Arms, you're the salt of the earth. Careful not to lose your saltiness. Because if you do, you're really good for nothing. What's so special about salt? Well, there's several things we'll just wrap up real quick. One is this, it's, it, it's seasons. Salt has the capacity to change the, the distinct flavor of anything that you put on it. It just makes a difference. As a Christian, guess what I'm supposed to do? 
as salt. My life is to be taken out of the container, shaken out in the world, all right? When, this, when the salt leaves the shaker, when I'm out there being what God's called me to, to be, when I'm out there doing what God wants me to do, I become a catalyst for change. I become a catalyst for being the person in my little area of the world that makes a tremendous and radical difference. I don't know why Christians are so afraid of this. I really believe, as we talked about last week, about overcoming some fear and issues, there's this, this mindset among Christians that we'll be salty at church. All right? We'll be salty at church. I'll come to church, and I'll raise my hands even, or I'll clap my hands, or I'll worship the Lord, and I'll listen to the sermon, and I'll say amen at all the right points. And I know where they are in case I'm missing Brother Joel say amen. <laughs> you know? Let me shake your salt a little bit, right? So, so, but this is not what he's talking about. He didn't say you're the salt of the church. He said you're the salt of the earth. But all too often we're content just to be the salt of church. Now there's the problem. If all we are is salt in church and not salt in the earth, then we're just being hypocrites. Because God didn't make us just to be salt here. He made us to be salt in the world that we live in and to make a difference. And we can't hide at church. It's amazing people come to church, they get all excited and they praise the Lord, but then they get out into the world the rest of the week. They seem to kind of hide, you know, hide. And on the other hand, if they do come to church and you don't notice they're at church, they get mad. But if they go out in the world and the world doesn't recognize it, they don't care. In fact, it seems they're doing everything they can not to be recognized and not to be salty. So we've certainly got this completely reversed and certainly got it completely turned around. Salt seasons, salt makes a difference. Ask yourself, am I really making any difference whatsoever in the world out there? You're supposed to. Second thing I'll say about salt, it creates thirst. Amen? It makes you thirsty. I grew up, uh, my, I had a grandfather as, as I was growing up that had a restaurant business. It's kind of, I think this is where I probably learned my work ethic more than anywhere else. One, because he was a hard taskmaster. You did it right or you, you'd be in trouble, all right? And, you know, I, I, I scrubbed floors, I washed dishes, you know, I, I cleaned the grill at night, all that stuff. You know, it's one of these greasy spoon mom and pop restaurants, you know, the diner. And so I, I learned what it was like to work. But I, I, I remember one thing that I was growing up. Every once in a while, he'd have these all-you-can-eat fish, catfish days, Right? And uh, I remember as we'd be pre preparing the food and putting it out back there, he'd say, hey, hey, salt that fish good. We salt out there. And I asked him one day, why do you always keep saying that salt that fish good? And you only say it on all you can eat days. He said, because you need to put a lot of salt on it because the people have got real thirsty and what they'll end up doing is drinking more tea than instead of eating fish. <laughs> Tea's cheap, fish cost me money. So let me tell you, next time you go all-you-can-eat buffet, please understand they have loaded it up with salt. <laughs> a lot of salt. Because they want you to leave after paying your $19.99 all-you-can-eat buffet saying, man, I was so good, I ate so much. No, you just ate $20 worth of tea. Because <laughs> it was salted up. But that's what salt does. It, it, and I believe also that even the context of that, is, well, somebody caught me on the way out today from Magnolia, said, we even crave salt. There's a desire for salt. We have to be careful not to get too much sodium intake in our diet and what we do because too much salt's not good. Now, I don't think most Christians are in that category yet of too much salt, all right? But they, I, we've got to realize that we're here and as we're living our life that it makes a difference in people because of the way we're living our lives, we'll want to come to Jesus. I, I remember one of the first times that I worked in a crusade with, with my brother who was preaching crusades at that time, I, I, I was helping him out with a, a crusade out in, in Magnolia. And we had a big tent set up there, and we had the services in the tent, and we'd take people inside the worship center for counseling. And there was someone who'd come, who'd gotten recently saved, become very close to Kathy and I, my brother and, and all of us, and he was a businessman, and his name was Gene. And Gene had only been saved a few months, but he was pumped, he was salty, man. He was pumped up for Jesus. And he brought his 72, 73-year-old mama to the crusade, all right? He didn't grow up in a religious environment, in a Christian environment. So he brings her to the crusade. I notice when the invitation is given, bless her heart, she just gets up and comes right down with everybody else. Well, I'm kind of in charge of the counseling, so I lead the group over and get the counselors working with people. But I want to hear what's going on with Gene's mama because, you know, Gene's my buddy. So I want to make sure his mama gets counseled right, you know. 
Somebody's not over there telling much stuff not true, so you never know. So I'm going over there and I'm listening in, and I just finally just sat down beside him and says, I said, Mrs. Cowles, it's so good you came forward today, but what do you want? Why, why, why did you come forward? He says, I'm not sure. But I'll tell you what I want. Whatever you did to Gene, my son, that's what I want. Like, I want some of that. <laughs> Whatever happened to him, that's what I want. That's salt. That's creating a thirst. My mother used to tell me all the time, she said, you need to bring your friends to church. Well, I wasn't interested in bringing my friends to church. Why? Because I didn't want to be at church. All right? I really didn't have any appetite for that either. I said, Mom, you know, you, 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 know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. To which she always commented, yeah, but you can put salt in his oats. <laughs> you salt his oats, he'll get thirsty. That's the same quality that our life is supposed to have. That we're to have this salty mindset, you know, and we ought to be excited about our life and excited about Jesus and excited about what God's doing. Our life, so that when people see it, they say, I don't know what he's got, but that's what I want. I don't know what's happening there, but I need to get on some of that, you know. That's not the average Christian. You look at most Christians, they, they just look like they're miserable. They look like they've just been gotten news of an IRS audit or something. I, I don't know what it is, but they're just, you know, it's defeat and it's gloom. But the nature of Christ, when we start really discovering who we are, and what that means to our life, then it begins to develop an excitement and a joy and a victory. And most Christians, I would say a majority, do not have that kind of life. They, they just don't know what it means. They, they, don't, they don't exalt Christ, they don't encourage the brothers, and they don't witness to the lost. Which is, that all wraps up three things. We don't exalt Christ, we don't encourage the fellowship, and we don't witness to the lost. Instead, we gripe. Instead, we complain. Instead, we gossip. We got a brother that's hurting. Well, you know what he did? You know what he's doing? Well, he shouldn't do it. You know? and, and that, we just missed it right there, buddy. You just fell off the horse somewhere. What are, you, what are you supposed to do about this? Recognize it? No. If you see it, you've got an opportunity there to do something about it and to be salt. Well, you realize, sister so-and-so, she's just, no, no, no. Back up, Jack. Or Jackie. <laughs> Where's your responsibility? If you're aware of something, God gave you the insight for a reason. Give you an insight so you could be the critic. So you can write an article. So you could spread the news about what's wrong with somebody. You're salt. And salt will be life and full of life. You, and you, you, you're the person who's salt in the oats, so to say. You know what else that salt does? It is a cleansing agent. In fact, it's used in, in making lye soaps and bromides. It's used in making chlorine. It's used in that, that process for whitening paper and purifying things. What does that mean for us as salt? It means that our lives will have a cleansing effect upon the world around us. Not only on my life, we use that word in the, in, in the Bible called sanctify. It means to make something clean. But Jesus said to his disciples, I've sanctified you. So what am I supposed to be? I'm supposed to be living in such a way that it has a cleansing effect on people's lives and upon the culture that I am and that God's doing something with me and through me. Our lives serve as that cleansing agent for the world. Again, back in, in, in Oriental culture and even in Mid-Eastern culture and even in Israel, babies, when they're born, were, were washed in, with, with salt. And I said in those saltless cultures, they even used blood, usually the blood of the father or his brother to wash those babies down. But salt, when salt was available, was used. Ezekiel, the prophet, is talking to the people who, who are not being what God's called to be. And he says, you know, it's for your birth and the day you were born. Somebody didn't cut your navel. We've got, we got a lot of people still connected, don't we? And broke free yet. He went on to say, and you weren't washed in water to supple thee, nor were you salted at all, nor were you swaddled at all. They don't realize who they are. They don't know what's going on. In fact, in Leviticus, he talked about just salting every offering that was put on, on the altar, all right? But it, it, it cleansed the sacrifice. It prepared the sacrifice. In those oriental cultures, when there was a child that was hitting his older years as a child and going into the teen years, and they might be a little stubborn or unwise or hard-headed, hard, hard, hard the saying about that child was, as the adults would stand and watch the ignorance of that child, they would say about that child, well, when he was born, he wasn't salted. This is the same thing the prophet's saying. Somebody didn't salt that kid. I'd like to say somebody didn't salt a lot of church members. Maybe you ought to baptize in salt water. I don't know. <laughs> but we need to get the saltiness back. I mean, you've heard people use that. How, well, he's a salty individual. He's a salty old guy. We need to be salty. What's that mean? It means I'm not this kind of neutral little thing that's just floating through the culture. 
you know, kind of bouncing around, around life. And every once in a while, stumble into some kind of usefulness. No, usefulness ought to be my goal in life. Purposefulness ought to be what I'm all about. I'm here for the glory of God. You're here for the kingdom of Christ. You're here to make a difference. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. What are you trying to hide for? God puts you on display. So shine. So be salty. Let God use you. And what will happen, it will make a difference. It has a cleansing effect. You know what else salt does? It has a healing, natural effect. For centuries, salt has been used for medicinal purposes to help in emergency situations. And it's been going on a long time. When they pick you up in the ambulance, they're going to start you on a saline solution many times, depending on the situation you're in. Most of the time, nobody has any idea. What's that saline? It's to reactivate the blood, and it's good for the blood to have that mild salt content going into it and re-stimulates it. So we're using, we're using it. There's a story about how, and I don't think kids do it anymore, but when, when, when there was a time when kids would take, and in the little mean ways they do it, they'd go off and get a bunch of, trap a bunch of flies and drown them. You know, that's kind of stuff I'd do. Drown them, and then you put them back out on a table where they can dry and just dump salt all over them. Give them a few minutes, those flies will start crawling out from under the salt and fly off. What happens? The salt begins to absorb all the moisture. It absorbs all the things that were clogging the breathing passage of those little flies, and, and they just fly off. American Indians, for many, many years, used salt as a healing remedy. When they're snake bit, I know you watched the movie where you got snake bit, and you lanced it, and you sucked all the blood out and spit it out. But what the truth was, they'd, they'd lance it and pack it with salt. And the salt kept the, the swelling from taking place and it drew out the venom that was in the, it, within the strike. In fact, in the late 1800s, there was a scientist who heard about that and tried some experiments with rabbits. And he took a group of rabbits and he put out bowls of very high, salty, high concentrate salt water for the rabbits to drink out of. And not one rabbit would drink out of it. Until he exposed the rattlesnake to the rabbits and the snake bit a rabbit and he took the snake out, the rabbit immediately went to the high concentrated salt water and drank it as quick as he possibly could. God just even put that in animals. Isn't that interesting? In ancient times, even salt was used to help prevent tooth decay. Let me tell you something. The hope for healing a sick world is salt. And you and I, we are the salt. One of the great illustrations, you might not have seen the... the, the, the the real symbolic picture in is Elijah has gone, Elisha is, has come, he comes into Jericho shortly after Elijah's been taken up into heaven, and as he enters into Jericho, the people are complaining. If you've ever been to Jericho, it's an oasis out in the middle of the desert, but it's also a tropical paradise in this little bitty patch of land. Every kind of fruit-bearing, you know, tropical citrus fruit, everything just grows crazy there. But in Elijah's day, in the day of the kings, all the fruit would never come to fruition. It'd come out, it'd bud on the tree, it'd begin to grow, and long before it was ready to pick, it would just die and fall off the tree. So Elisha comes to town, and they ask Elijah about this. In 2 Kings, the story is, chapter 2, it says, and he said to the people, after they told him, hey, what, what, what are we going to do? We've got this beautiful spring water here. We've got this great oasis here, but nothing ever lives long enough to take any advantage of it. It just decays and rots. He said, bring me a new cruise, a vase, and put salt in it. And they brought it to him. In verse 21, and he went forth unto the springs of the water, where the fed, which fed the oasis. And he cast the salt in there. And he said, thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or any more barren land. Great passage. Salt, why salt? Because obviously this is what the Lord's trying to say to these people at the time, that he takes it to the source where the spring feeds the oasis and he puts it right in there. Guess what God does to us? He comes right to the source of our life, into our hearts, makes a radical change there, and now there should be no more barrenness that comes out. We ought to be fruitful, productive, living full lives for the glory of God. We become those people who have experienced the healing and in turn use that healing relationship to help other people. It's a, it's a healing, but it also has preservative qualities. It's used to preserve, as we said, olives. It's to preserve meats, to preserve fish. Still today, that's done. Understand that we're living in a culture that is quickly decaying. We've probably not seen a 
a culture as decadent and wicked as the culture we're living in since the Roman Empire. Everything that was bad then is here now and multiplied to even a greater extent. We're living in a corrupt culture. We're living in a decaying world. That's why the Bible says, you shall not love the world, neither the things are in it. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Hey, but we're in the world, and God loves the world in regard to the people of the world. And we're supposed not to love the worldly things, but we're to love the people in the world. What do we do? We need to be the salt in that culture. We are the hope of preserving lives. We're the hope of extending people's life and fullness of life. If the society is decadent and decaying, our responsibility is to be salty preservative in the world that we live in. But not only is it a preservative, this is the part that bugs some people. It's also an irritant. You ever get that little paper cut on your hand or something and you get a little perspiration and every time you start sweating a little bit, it just starts stinging and stinging and stinging? Salt can be an irritant like that. This is, this is the life of Jesus. Jesus either divided him or decided him. There's a lot of folks that didn't like Jesus. There's a lot of people who not only didn't like Jesus, there's a lot of folks who wanted Jesus dead. You need to get over this, folks. There's going to be a lot of folks who just don't like you. I mean, just, they just don't like you. I had to get over this early in my ministry. I really did. I, I, you just have to understand, Joe, if you're going to preach like that, there's not going to be a, people that, a whole lot of people that just like you. All right? The people you're speaking to who don't want to be salt, who don't want to be, you know, to, to live that full and victorious Christian life, those are the people, you know, they're comfortable and they don't want anybody upsetting the comfort zone. They'll just, they'll tolerate you perhaps, but you're going to irritate them. Every time you get to preach, they're just going to tune you out, check you off the board. Why? Because you'll serve as an irritant. All right? In fact, some will get upset. Religious people don't like it. Carnal Christians don't like it. Dead Christians don't like it. Defeated Christians don't like it. Christians in bondage don't like it. So do we stop? No. Because there's going to be a lot of those people, if I just stay salty, who'll get on board sooner or later. God's going to do a work in their life. But do I tone down the salt? Do I leave it inside the shaker because I know somebody's going to, feelings are going to be hurt? Jesus said, no, 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 no. He said, if they're offended by me, they're going to be offended by you. And you need to understand they're not really offended by you. They're offended by me. It's me they're mad at. It's what Jesus tried to tell us. So get over it, all right? Just, just, just be the salt. Even, even if it hurts, even if it's a struggle at times, be the salt. Have the courage to be salty in your life. Don't be that person who's just, who, who, who just sits back and complains about stuff and picks out things that are wrong because if you're going to be salty, you're going to be under a microscope. If you're going to be salty, people are always going to be looking to find something which they can blame on you. That's why the Bible says, so, so live this kind of life, 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2 again, but be blameless. He said, if you'll live it and you'll be blameless before the Gentiles and before the people you're preaching to and you'll just live a righteous life, he says, listen, you will put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You'll, you, it'll shut them up sooner or later. It's going to come, it may not be today, it may not be next week, it may not even be next year, but sooner or later, you know, he says, and ultimately he says, they'll give glory to God. That's what that passage goes on to say. They'll start glorifying God because you lived it and you walked it and you talked it. There was a marriage between what you said and what you did. You weren't content to have behavior, all right? I mean, a belief with no behavior. You have a belief that personifies itself in flesh as being a salty Christian to the world. That's what God's called us to be. That's what God's called us to do, even if it seems to be an irritant. And be sure that people are going to pick out every little thing they can if you're going to live this way. So you you know, you can't, be, you, can't, you can't let those things stop you or hinder you. Ultimately, as we go down this list, you know what the Bible gives us a clear picture of? Salt always represents life. Jesus was life. Jesus is life. And his life was light and salt and obviously irritated a lot of people. Now, that's not the goal here. And praise God, it doesn't have to be the goal because... You know, it's not something that you can set out to do probably, but the idea is if you're really going to live for Jesus, I want to be in your heart to make people mad. It's in your heart to restore. It's in your heart to season. It's in your heart to preserve. It's in your heart to cleanse. It's in your heart to, you know, to, to make a difference in people's lives, to salt the environment. But ultimately, what does salt do? Salt represents our life in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are a different person. He has changed our life. And now 
You see all these different things symbolically that salt do, does, those are all the things that, that we do. We delay the corruption in the world around us. We make a difference. The Bible tells us that, this, that we are the world's salt. You are the salt of the earth. I can't be the salt of the earth and sit in church. All right? You're the salt of the earth. It gets outside of the... This is just where the salt gathers. This is like the shaker. Somebody got to get out there and shake it out once we get to the world. You know? Some of you don't have any trouble at the restaurant. You pick it right up. Every bite. You know? You want salt on it. The world, whether it realizes or not, is craving salt. They want somebody to point the way. They want to see somebody that's genuine. They've seen plenty of that which is not genuine. Let's be the real thing. Because if we're not, then we're nothing. The Bible says even let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Now, let's take that from the back part. Answer every man. We don't think we're responsible to answer anybody. We don't think we have responsibility to tell one lost person anything. And you're going to be shocked one day when you have to stand before God and say, God, hey, okay, how many did you win? Or at least how many did you witness to? The winning is his part. Witnessing is our part. Hey, how many did you tell about me? Uh, well, not really. I took them to church. I don't guess I, I really couldn't get the words out. We're going to have to give an account for this. This is, this is I mean, if we weren't, why would the scripture tell us we were? If we weren't, why would the Lord leave us here after we got saved? The Bible says, here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. There's life being reproduced as a result of your life. And you know what happens? You know when fruit's produced? In fellowship. When the pollen starts fellowship, and guess what happens? There's, there, there, there's, there's fruit. When mom and dad start fellowshipping, guess what? There's fruit. There's babies. When the church is spiritually in fellowship, then we get to see some spiritual babies. It starts here being what God's called to be, but it's carried outside these doors to be what God wants us to be. And so we have this responsibility to, to speak to, to the world. Go to the, all the nations, the Bible says. Preach the word of God. We have this responsibility, but we, we close it off. He says, then as you speak... Let there be so much grace in your life that when you, words come out, which means words come out, they'll be seasoned with salt. Why? That's what makes a difference. You know, too often our words are seasoned with anger. Our hypocrisy, our meanness, our arrogance, our pride, all kinds of things we can season with are not things that we should season. But catch this, when the salt loses its savor, it is what? It's good for nothing. Good for nothing. It's good for nothing. There's a lot of people that are good but for nothing. What's it mean to be good for nothing? It means you have a purpose, and if you're not fulfilling the purpose, then you're a good person. I mean, you, 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 know, you come to church, you pay your bills, you... You know, keep the yard in the neighborhood at least decent. And, you know, you, 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 you take care of your responsibilities. You, you, you bring the bread home. You, you supply the clothes for the family. You, you're a good guy. You're a good woman. You know, you're a good mom. You're a good dad. But are we just good for nothing? We're good for nothing. We're not taking the message of life and the greatness and the glory of God out to a lost world and sharing that message there. You, I mean, over and over and over and over and over and over. In the Word of God, this message keeps coming back. Proclaim the excellence. What are we doing? We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about Christ. We're talking about grace. We're talking about heaven. We're talking about hell. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about the blood. We're talking about the cross. We're talking about the resurrection. And if we're not mixing that kind of behavior with our belief, then it's a waste of time. It's there, as we said last, there has to be the marriage between my walk and my talk, that's what makes the difference. And if it's not there, I'm good. I'm a good old boy. I'm a good old, you may be the best little gal in town, but hey, you're good for nothing. You know, like I say, we've got a lot of good for nothing folks in our churches. Brother Autry, when he was sharing with the men about salt, he did make this reference. He said, in the Middle East, 
they'd build their ovens out of stone and brick and they'd build them outside the house obviously the way the church of the homes were and they'd build these big ovens and as they put it all together uh, they'd dig a pit as they began and they'd pack the pit full of salt and then they'd put the oven tiles on it and they'd build the stone and brick all around it but after a period of time the salt would lose its savor the effect it would have upon the cooking process and all that it was there to do it'd lose its savor so they'd have to dismantle it, dismantle the floor, take out the salt, and it'd just be cast aside. This is the picture given. Salt just cast aside. It's not good for anything anymore. And then they'd rebuild the stove by packing fresh salt in it, putting the tiles down. But the idea was that there's piles of salt everywhere you go. Why? Well, that was salt, but it was, no, it, was, it was thrown aside. Why? Because it really didn't have any purpose anymore. Paul said, you know, my greatest fear is that I'd be a castaway. Not that he loses salvation. Castaway means that I would become of no use. I'm just going through the Christian life, singing my little Christian songs, but not making any difference in the world in which I live. If I get to that place, that oh, God, don't let me ever get there. I don't want to be that. God forbid that I would be just cast away like salt. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In other words, every work that I do, which is good, should be accompanied with a message which brings glory to God, which causes the world to see that, hey, what he's about is not just religion. And what he's about, he's not just part of some little special club that has to be good. He's, he's a changed individual. God's done something in his life. He is salty, salty, salty. It's good for nothing. When's it good for nothing? When it makes no difference. Savorless salt. Do you know what savorless salt tastes like? Whatever you put it on. makes no difference. And here we are, salt being put on a corrupt world. We're making it make any difference. We're savorless salt. It's whatever you, whatever you apply it to. That's not the intention. The intention is to be salty, to make a difference. When it says, when salt loses its savor, it's good for nothing. The word is moreno. We get that Greek word, we, we have derived another word from it called moron. It's the same word in the Greek language that's used for moron. To be foolish. It's foolishness. When a Christian loses his savor or doesn't work within the savor that God's given his salty life, then he's, he's a moron. <laughs> I know that might seem a little bit hard, but I didn't write the Bible, you know, so take it up with the author. He wrote it, we quote it. Amen. Some of y'all laying and wait for me already. If the Chronicle writes something you don't agree with, do you stone the paper boy when he throws it? No. <laughs> You just take your paper and write your letter to the editor. God says it's, and, and really it is a word that's it, it's translated sometimes to lose savor. It's also translated one time, and it twice is to become fool or to make foolish is one time, or to act foolishly. In other words, for a Christian not to be salty is foolishness. And you're acting foolish. So what do we do? We change the course of our life back to the cross and back to the Lord, fall in love with Jesus again and say, Lord, I want to be used in the Word. To even think about the fact that God lets me be a part of it blows my mind. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you forgot what a failure you were before Jesus. Amen? Maybe forget, I don't know about you. Maybe if you think you were something when you were nothing and then you've deceived yourself, the Bible says. But before Christ, we're just, you know, like I said, we're just pretty much nothing. And then to get a picture of God's grace and love at the cross and his plan for the world and his, the sacrifice of his soul, something mind-blowing, just glory to God, that's a big. I and mean, it's awesome. And then God says, okay, I want you to be a part of this deal. What? I want you to be a part of this. No! Come on. Yeah, I want you to be, I want you to be my ambassador. Ambassador? Come on. Yeah. I can't do that. That's all right. I'll do it in you. I'm going to make you new. I've created a brand new person. You're not what you used to be. And what do we do? We just be foolish enough, according to the world, be foolish enough to just believe what God said and go do it. Just go do it. How do you do it? You open your mouth. God will give you every opportunity in the world and just be willing to open your mouth. You live it, you lip it. You with me? You walk it, you talk it. You believe it, you behave it. It's who you are. I'll tell you, you know why you're frustrated as a Christian many times? Because we've not been who we are. You know, I, get, I feel that way with my wife sometimes. I just act real stupid. Don't say amen. <laughs> just act stupid. 
And you know, and, and, and God just kind of says, that, that's not who you are. You're my child. You're my son. You're a priest of the Lord. You're ambassador of Christ. You know? It's like talking to that person this week. He's, he's struggling with, with, with this particular problem. In life. Why? That's not you. You're a child of God. I know, but I just keep going. No, you don't know. You, you, think, you think you're helpless. You think you've got to do it. You think, I just have to do it. No, you don't. Can I say that one more time? No, you don't. And in case you missed it, no, you don't. <laughs> you're free in Christ. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. So get out there and shine and be salty. That's what God's called us to. Hallelujah. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.